My name is Jessie Jenkins. I am the student body president this year, and my major is English, secondary education, and I chose SFA because of their teaching school. I heard it was one of the best, and I'm finding out it is. I chose education as my major because I absolutely love helping people, and my bigger goal is to be in administration. Being SGA president has absolutely helped me, especially in the realm of working in a professional environment and with administrators on campus. What I like about Nacogdoches the most is the nature. I love seeing the trees and the flowers, especially in the springtime. I would recommend SFA to my friends because of the relationships that will be built between the professors and the teachers, and I want that for all of my friends. As always, Axe and Jacks. All right, welcome back for the last, our final uh, panel of the day in dealing with revisiting history. This was an idea we've done, I think if you may remember a couple years ago, the last Lone Star Legislative Summit, we dealt with the issue in the tricentennial year of Nacogdoches of racial diversity in Texas, Nacogdoches being the original melting pot of Texas, many different cultures being here 300 years ago, and the theme was, who were we then, who are we today, and more importantly, who do we want to be in the future? That's an issue, I think, a, a, a concept that we all need to have an opportunity to talk about, but it just doesn't fit neatly into the legislative process. And so, as the host of this event, I thought it's a good idea to try to inject some of those broader policy discussions into the into it, and we can talk transportation or education or health care, those more wonky policy uh, legislative type issues. But I think it's appropriate that we take the time and, and talk about some issues that, that there's a, a great deal of diversity of thought. And hopefully, gentlemen, we'll be able to do this in a civil and respectful way, <laughs> which I have no doubt will occur. Uh, these, the, the, and I have, uh, they've, I've, they've stuck me on the panel. I've been a moderator, and uh, I'm going to sit over there. So we have our our Democratic friends on this side, and I'm going to keep them apart. And then I got our Republicans here, including our senator. So they're going to be introduced in a little bit. But our moderator today, and I was really happy about this, we were who do we want to have moderate this discussion uh, about history and how we respect that in our uh, in our lives and, and how it's taught and how it's remembered, uh, how it's preserved. And a, a very good friend, a mutual friend of ours, uh, that they call John now, who's the, the chairman of the Texas Historical State Historical Association, and he said, you need to get John Crane. I said, okay, and he had talked to them. We visited, he's the vice chair of the commission. He's the president CEO of the Summerlee Foundation. He is the past president of the Texas State Historical Association and is a life member of its board of directors. He's also the former chairman of the Dallas County Historical Commission, ex officio member of the Sixth Floor Museum. If you haven't been there, you really need to go check that out. Uh, an advisory director of the Texas State History Museum Foundation and director of the SMU Clement Center. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Texas and a master's degree from Southwest Texas State University, which is what I still call it too. And, uh, but but it's, it's good to have John here because I know he has a passion, uh, a real uh, appreciation and knowledge of history. And if there's one thing that I would say at the outset, even though I'm a panelist, I'll say the, the I think one of the hardest things to grapple with People that, it's people that argue history the most adamantly oftentimes are the least informed and knowledgeable of history. Amen. And so what we need to do is, is in history needs to be taught in school. Those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it, as the saying goes. So uh, let's dive into this. I'm going to let John introduce the panelists. Mr. Crane, come on up. I think I'm the oldest. That's, that's why I'm here this afternoon. Not the wisest, the oldest. Uh, again, what I'm going to do is like what we do at the THC meetings. I'm going to ask that we start right here with the senator, work our way down. If you can share with us uh, the, where you're from and why you're so interested in history. Go ahead, sir. OK, everybody hear me? Yeah. Good. It's, it's good to be here. I'm Brandon Creighton, uh, State Senator of District 4. Uh, so I represent a good part of Montgomery County, north of Houston, Conroe Woodlands, uh, Lake Conroe, uh, through the Kingwood, Humble, and Spring area around the east side of Houston all the way to the coast at part of Galveston. And then from there, 65 miles of coastline to the Louisiana border at Beaumont, Port Arthur, and 
Port Natchez Grove. So I've got a very interesting district, uh, great economic engine for Texas, and it's, I believe this is my third time here for uh, the trip to really feature one of the, the greatest parts of the state, including its greatest natural resource, its people. And I'm, I'm proud to, of the hosts. And what uh, Representative Clarty Smooth was it, with his intro into the subject matter we're about to get into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I uh, just really appreciate being here and being a part uh, of, of all of these topics and being here with you. The, the legislative sessions are always interesting and they, they change and, and they evolve and, and the people evolve, but your voice um, is what drives all of that. And uh, it, the, the interim is where we have great discussions like this uh, to frame the topics for next time around and, and history is uh, very important to me and uh, my heritage of Texas, and I'm proud to Super. be here. Super. Thank you. Representative? Okay. Uh, I'm Dustin Burroughs. I just finished my uh, second session. I am from Lubbock, Texas, uh, born and raised there all my life. I was a ag student, FFA, went off a little bit to school, came back. I've been practicing law there ever since. Uh, I think everybody on this panel I consider a friend and a good colleague and somebody that I enjoy working with. Um, I'm on the Ag Committee, the, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, Banking Committee, Investments and Financial Services. Uh, we do a lot with the Republican Caucus, but you know, when we talk about history, I think of my three boys. I think of all the uh, young children in the district and the families and wanting to make sure that they're exposed to a rounded, well-rounded and accurate view of what happened because um, that's the foundation of going forward and making sure we have some common understanding and common ground. And I want to share what I grew up with and my knowledge with them. And I think that most families and parents and legislators want to make sure that we have that foundation and guiding principles. My name is Eric Johnson, and I'm a state representative from Dallas, Texas. People ask me what part of Dallas I represent. I say the best part. That's all you need to know. Um, I've been in the legislature for eight years now, and my interest in history really dates back to high school. It was my favorite class in high school. I fell in love with American history. I went on to Harvard University and majored in American history, earned a degree in, with honors in American history, and it's something I think about all the time. I just uh, have a deep appreciation for um, what I believe history is, which is um, telling the story of what happened. Um, and people can put their judgments on what happened, um, but telling what happened in an accurate way is a very important thing. I think we all learn from history. So um, that's my connection to the subject matter. And I have to say, it's my first time ever in Nacogdoches, my first time ever on campus, and I'm blown away. I, I love the city. It's beautiful. And I really have enjoyed my time on campus here at the university. It's a gorgeous school, and um, you should be very proud of it. And Representative Clark, you're lucky to represent it. It's a great place. Representative Clark. Clark. Uh, I'm Judy's husband, um, <laughs> and I, I oftentimes serve as your state representative, represent Cherokee, Ruskin, and Nacogdoches counties. Uh, Y'all have been hearing me talk way too much today, uh, so I'm going to, I want to give uh, Poncho a little more time because he's got an interesting perspective. I will say this, I'm a fifth generation Texan. I think, uh, I didn't really realize this until right now, all, all five of us are uh, attorneys. Yeah. Uh, I think that analytical skill and view may inform how we uh, see the world. Uh, it'll be interesting to see as we go back and forth, but uh, uh, you know, I've always enjoyed history growing up. Uh, uh, Eagle Scout, our family took trips all over the country, and our trips were not going to Disneyland or going to places or going to a beach and house. We were going to Civil War battlegrounds. We were going to Yorktown. We were going to you know the museums of Smithsonian. That's what we did and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. I would have, wouldn't do it any other way. And hopefully we pass that along to our four sons. Uh, but uh, uh, I think I have a deep and abiding uh, appreciation and love for history. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, those of us sitting up here will actually be able to make some. The, uh, thank you, Travis, and, and thank you, uh, Commissioner. I, uh, I represent the largest house district in the United States. It spans 45,000 square miles. It sits in two time zones. And I don't think it's an accident that when people think about Texas, they think about the area that I represent. You see it more often than not in movies. You see it more often than not on brochures. When people come from um, Paris and London and Rome and different parts of the world, they think of Texas and they think of my district. And you know, when I come out of here, 
I'm reminded of how beautiful other parts of the states are. Uh, other parts of the state are. I came last year, and you know, Travis and I broke into the legislature together three sessions ago, and I was standing on on his balcony last time I was here, and I was looking down at the Camino Real, and I was reminded that you know, about 400 and something miles south and west of here, I can sit and or stand on the same road, and it'll take me to the same place. And so, when you look at you know my interest in history, it starts from there, is knowing that. You know, my family and a good part of my family back then was responsible for launching the trips that made places like Nacogdoches and then later San Antonio possible. And, uh, you know, reading about my forefathers uh, receiving the Canary Islanders in Guerrero to send them on their way to what became Bear, Bear County and San Antonio and the mission and then making sure that they made their way all the way out here with a lot of success because this is the oldest town, uh, although it's not the oldest inhabited place in the Americas. It's the oldest town. And I give, uh, I give you all a lot of credit for that. It's beautiful out here. I enjoy every time that I come out here. I tell my kids that uh, I want them to come when you know we don't have school because they can spend some days walking on the Camino Real and knowing it connects them to something very important and deep in our past. And that's why I enjoy that. And that's why I enjoy being on this panel. So. Well, you can see we have a very distinguished panel. And before we get into uh, other issues, We've had two monuments placed on the Capitol grounds in recent years. We have the Tejano Monument. We have the African American Monument. Uh, does anyone care to, to share thoughts about either of these monuments or both and the impact they may have had uh, on legislators and decision makers? I'm happy to take a stab at the African American monument. I know something about it, but I was not in the legislature when the decision was made um, statutorily to uh, set aside an appropriation to get that monument started. Um, that was put in place by a, a, a former member of the House named Al Edwards, who was a state representative from Houston, who was the chair of the, of the Black Caucus at the time. Uh, who thought it was important that somewhere on the Capitol grounds the contributions that African Americans have made to the state of Texas be memorialized in a monument. Um, and so it took a long time to get the monument built because uh, it wasn't fully funded by the appropriation. I think the appropriation that was made was in support of uh, a little bit of uh, support for the, the design and maybe the placement or something like that. I don't want to um, get that wrong, but I, but I do know that the bulk of the money had to be raised through private funds, and that took a long time. And it finally got done, I think two years ago was when the money was finally um, sufficient to actually get the, the work done and, and installed. And if you haven't been to the Capitol, um, it's, it's pretty impressive. I, like I said, I wasn't part of the process that built it, but um, it's, it's near the actual, it's interesting enough, it's near um, the Civil War um, Veterans Memorial in the South Lawn, which is the main entrance to the Capitol. It's a pretty prime location um, next to that um, Civil War monument, and it's it's very elaborate and it's it's universally been hailed as a very fine monument in terms of its appearance, um, and it really pretty much depicts in a linear fashion the sort of history of African Americans and their uh, contributions to the state of Texas, and that's the monument I, I can speak to. Great. But great. Anybody have thoughts about the Tejano Monument? I mean, I, I guess it falls to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, why, why, I don't, why is that? I don't understand your point. <laughs> Go figure. The, uh, I mean, I, uh, you know, I come from a place I tell people, you know, the inmates run the asylum. And what I mean by that is it's not, I remember my first campaign, I, I went to a neighboring county and they said, hey, uh, you're going to do real good here. You're going to win the Mexican vote. I'm like, what's that? Because we only have the vote in my county. I mean, I don't, there's, there, our county historically, and, and if you look at, and the reason I tell you this is because you have to understand a little bit about how uh, Mexico ceded, uh, physically ceded part of Texas after some of the wars in the early 1800s to the U.S., including, you know, in 1836 and then later in 1842 is, the larger land holdings that were held by, uh, you know, Spanish Mexicans, and at that point, what were, uh, I guess you could call them Tejanos because they were the, on the other line of the Nueces or on the other side of the Rio Grande. They were, for the most part, held together by the families. In other words, they weren't broken apart. And the reason for that is there was a lot of support within the community amongst themselves. And then the other reason is 
the Mexican army was just right across the river, and they felt an obligation. And I think the, the U.S. felt the, the threat of another war because these guys were ready to go if they would mess with these land holdings. The further north and east that you got, it became more difficult for these things to kind of hold themselves together. So you start getting to ranches and, and family holdings beyond what's now Webb County, um, Maverick County, and then right around there, and you start seeing a difference. And you start seeing the further west you go, by the time you got up to places like Valverde County, um, Presidio County, Brewster County, I mean, those land grants were broken up, I mean, completely. There wasn't very many Hispanics or now, you know, Tejanos, if you will, in charge of these land ranch holdings anymore. It was virtually, they were done. And so it's hard when you're coming from a place where you don't really see all those things about what your fellow compatriots or fellow citizens, if you will, suffer because you don't, it's not around you. You know, you, you grew up in a different world and you start mo moving further north and east and you start seeing the difference. You realize that the, one of the last schools, if not the last school to integrate after Brown v. Board in the United States was in Valverde County, it was in my district. It was in 1974. So think about that. Brown v. Board was when? 1954. And so, you know, you fast forward to the idea of a monument at the Capitol and you say, okay, well, who's it for and why? Well, you know, I never really thought about it in the context of myself because I didn't grow up in that world. I grew up in a different one. But then I go outside and I say, you know what? It's necessary. It's necessary because there's a whole slew of people that were somehow erased and forgotten when it came to thinking about what they had contributed to what this state was, what it could be, and what it is now. And, you know, whether you agree with monuments or not, or how they work, or how they fit into your beliefs, you can't deny a people's existence in terms of their historical impact to the place that you live and that I live. And that's why I see the monument. And I, you know, I, I don't, I can't tell you that I spent a lot of time lingering and looking at it because it doesn't fit neatly into what I believe to be, you know, where I come from and how I've been brought up. But I think for a whole lot of us, it symbolizes the idea that we're just a part of this state as anybody else. And as long as we keep identifying, I think, across the board, no matter what your beliefs are, that we can find some common ground, and no matter what the monument is, that this is something that kind of threaded through our background, I think we'll be okay. I think when we, we lose sight and we start to get a little uh, bent out of shape because we refuse to believe that these things are, are part of us, and that's where we make the mistake. And you may not be able to identify it because you didn't live it, but they're still a part of you, whether you want to believe that or not. And I, I would uh, encourage all of us to remember that as we deal with each other. I think we forget that. And that's the one thing that monuments and, th and history can do for all of us. It can tie us together where we thought we couldn't be tied together. And so that's the way I see that. Is it possible they also tear us apart? Yeah, I mean, if we let it. I mean, I, I've seen it. I've seen examples of that. I mean, I can tell you, you know, we had this conversation last night is, you know, there's probably a few things at the Capitol that for no other reason that they're complete, uh, you know, they're, they're just completely fabricated and false in terms of you know, it's, it's almost gaslighting. They want you to believe. So what you're searching for is authenticity. You want something that is truthful, the, the factual. Truth, the truth shouldn't, it shouldn't hurt you now at this point. It shouldn't hurt any of us. You know, we should be able to look at it and say, you know what, as awful and as bad as this was or as great and wonderful as it was, we, we have to deal with it on the same level. But when it's not the truth, then we should question that. Well, right? the University of Texas decided to take down several statues uh, John H. Reagan, uh, Jefferson Davis, uh, Albert Sidney Johnson, and uh, someone actually had roots in Nacogdoches, John H. Reagan. John H. Reagan started his career as a surveyor right here in Nacogdoches. He was postmaster of the Confederacy. They also tapped the, uh, the Hogg statue. James Stephen Hogg is one that ought to probably come down, although Hogg did not participate in the in you know, a civil war at all. So, at any rate, a lot of things are happening. Uh, Robert E. Lee High School in San Antonio has just changed its name a short time ago to Lee High School. Does that take care of it? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I grew up driving by an elementary school. It's Robert E. Lee Elementary every day. I mean, it's still there. And, 
you, you grow up long enough and you see these things long enough and you don't believe there's anything wrong with them, you know, generally speaking, because they're just there. And I think the, and it's just like the Confederate flag, and I'll give you an example. The last, uh, the last active uh, troop in the field for the Confederacy crossed the Rio Grande at Eagle Pass and they buried their flag on the Texas side of the river and they, they, they drove into Mexico to continue the fight. They didn't get very far. They, were, they wanted to join up with uh, the imperial forces of the then emperor of Mexico to continue the fight, and it didn't happen. But we have a mural at our high school that depicts the bearing of the flag, and it's there. And so you look at that context, is it wrong to display the Confederate flag within the context of memorializing something that actually happened? And my answer to that is no, because they did that. They went to the river, they took the battle flag, and they buried it somewhere. Is it wrong to display the Confederate flag in a museum in the context of explaining what it was as a battle flag? Of course not. You know, is, should we dis be displaying a, a Confederate flag in the office of an elected office holder in the Capitol? I don't think so, because that's not, you know, unless it's a, uh, in the historical context, no. But in those contexts, you know, what's wrong with that? What is, that, what is the problem with having a mural that depicts the civil, uh, the battle flag in that context, they're trying to teach you something. They're not making a comment about whether the flag is appropriate or not. It is what it is. And so, I, I think, think we have a, another person. Yeah, no, I apologize. Like, no, no, no. Talking. Let me just mention this. I was kind of thinking about this as you were visiting. You know, I go through my district and most of the people that I talk to, they're concerned about you know, building highways to Lubbock. It's a very remote part of the state. They're concerned about the high price of pharmaceuticals. They're concerned about health insurance costs. They're concerned about their children's education. They're facing a lot of problems that I guarantee you everybody in all of our districts are facing and probably 90% are talking about. And the things that I realize is maybe I have conservative solutions for those problems versus progressive ones, but we have the same people with the same problems and we focus on that. This is an issue. I know it's going to continue to be something that we talk about, but you know, in some ways to me it's a bit of a wedge issue because there are so many problems that most of us want us communicating on and working on and focusing on. And so it's just, uh, you know, it, it's very interesting that we come at it from a different place. I'll comment this way. The only time I ever hear about this is when the national news has picked it up or something is talking about it and Lubbock is named after a Confederate soldier, a former governor. Snyder, you know, Scurry County, Terry, Borden, those are counties I represent, all named after him. And the only thing I ever hear is, are people going to try to force us to change our name? And that's usually the only time, at least from the West Texas perspective, it even comes up in the conversations. And most of them say, we really want to focus on these other issues. Senator? Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, all the comments are good. I have great respect for everyone uh, that I've serving with here on the panel and working with each of you, you know, through tough issues always during session. And I, I also want to say that Teano Monument and the African American Monument, I'm very proud of both of those. Uh, actually, we take a staff picture um, at the end of every session and uh, the Teano Monument, I, I think uh, we chose that one last time. It's just one of the finest. So is the African American Monument. Both of them are just incredible. And uh, to my knowledge, I think it's, those are two uh, of the monuments that uh, in the past that we put actual state funding appropriated towards where many of those on the monument tour uh, <coughs> had to be funded through private foundations and, and private fundraising just because funds were lean uh, with in state government in general when most, well, many of them were erected. But I, I, and we're here to talk about monuments, right? My notes say the history of the big thicket from Conroe to Nacogdoches and the agribusiness involved. So I didn't, no, I'm kidding with you. <laughs> <laughs> that was the session right before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but I, I think uh, I, I don't have a Harvard perspective uh, on it. Uh, <laughs> and, really one. I, I have more of a Montgomery, Texas perspective. And I, again, I, I'm learning as all of us are up here. And, and I always kid uh, Representative Johnson. He, he is a brilliant guy. Uh, but I, I do think when we're talking about monuments, um, it, it's something that's in the heritage behind them. It's something very important to me to preserve that rather than tear them down and melt them and move them to closets without accurate depictions. Because uh, we just, we find ourselves in a, in a crossroads in time where many people feel either disenfranchised or um, they're uh, 
offended by different things that, uh, that personally I would like uh, to see what happens at the state capitol in the, in the 30 years I've been working around there, first as a staffer and then as a legislator in the House and Senate, which is that the diversity in the state of Texas now has never been greater. I'd also like to add it, it's the state's never been more conservative. And so those, those two things you never hear intersect in the media, but the families and the diversity represented laughing and hugging and taking pictures on the Hood's Brigade monument and the, and the Civil War monuments that are depicted around that many say are divisive and need to go, they're happy and so proud and so motivated by where we are today in the state of Texas versus where we were in the past. And they are teaching their kids that and their grandkids that from happy times in the past and dark times in the past and growing up I didn't have the means to go to a museum. I, there weren't museums around Cut and Shoot, Texas. I had to walk in parks in, in the big city next door called Conroe. And I had to learn from that from my parents and my family. And um, my grandfather, five times back, he chaired the Constitutional Committee at Washington on the Brazos when they feared the Al Alamo uh, soldiers and occupants had been slaughtered. And then uh, 27 years later, he founded a school for freedmen. It even, is even, very... even, even though his family and all of them served in Terry's Texas Rangers and, and in Bowling Green, Kentucky mm -hmm. for the Confederacy. Yeah. So in serving for the Confederacy and then also 27 years later, creating one of the biggest schools for freedmen in the Lake Conroe, what is now the Lake Conroe area, they received death threats and uh, violent acts day in and day out because others felt like uh, educating freedmen was a bad thing. And I'm, I'm very proud that my family was involved in that as I'm proud in preserving the history depicted in the monuments that are erected. And if we need to put a General Grant statue next to a Robert E. Lee statue all over Texas and post in neon, winner! <laughs> above General Grant, then let's do that. I have not heard that suggested. <laughs> let's, well let's, let's do great. that and let's do it and let's fund it and let's accurately depict it. And because I'll tell you what, I've been to Gettysburg. I've been to the fields of Gettysburg and I didn't feel like I deserved to walk on that hallowed ground. I tell you, I almost walked off the field because I didn't feel like I deserved to walk on it. But to stand in the room where Lincoln drafted and wrote the Gettysburg Address, and then to walk out into the fields where General Grant on his horse and Robert E. Lee on his horse are, are on uh, 40 feet off the ground, and the learning of thousands and thousands of people that come from all over the world, the learning that takes place from, from both of those examples. I can't imagine that Robert E. Lee would ever be removed from those hallowed fields. And if he were, what would that do to what we're saying about where we have come and evolved in the United States and in the state of Texas from years past? William Barrett Travis owned a slave at the Alamo named Joe. My son's middle name is Barrett. It doesn't make me a racist because I named my son after a slave owner. Sam Houston, one of my heroes, he was vilified for his stance to not participate in the Confederacy. Yet years later, um, after the Confederacy, on the Lincoln Memorial, uh, it's the Gettysburg Address is very well depicted, and the word traitor is never in that, only veteran. And widows were allowed um, of the Confederate soldiers to take a pension, a veteran's pension, even though they were never quite given the status that a Union veteran um, deserved, and I understand that. Uh, but they are in Arlington Cemetery for a reason, and I just think that where do we go with all of this if we just say remove them, melt them, and hide them? Representative Johnson, we have an, uh, an interesting issue in Dallas with the Robert E. Lee statue in Lee Park that was removed, mm -hmm. and we have uh, discussions ongoing to some degree about Pioneer uh, Park's Confederate monument. Uh, do you see that a lot of these discussions tend to be in uh, urban communities like Dallas, Houston, and are they not happening necessarily in Lubbock? Uh, could be wrong, but they might be. 
I don't know. Well, I'll let the representative from Lubbock speak to what's happening there because I'm not really familiar. <laughs> but I will say that my guess would be that the discussion tends to uh, bubble up more frequently in areas where you have uh, more diversity of viewpoint naturally due to more disparities um, in, I'd say, racial diversity, eth you know, economic diversity, those types of things. When you have these larger cities with lots of different communities um, inhabiting the, 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 the city, then the public spaces can become a, a topic of debate about who um, we are honoring with those spaces. And that's maybe one point that I want to try to put out there. This, this conversation can never be um, dealt with adequately in an hour, and I don't think a debate, which we're not having here, this is not a debate, um, but a, a debate format certainly doesn't lend itself very well no. to this topic because nobody's really coming to this forum with the intention of being convinced and picking a side and taking a vote and saying, well, did you, when you walked in the room, did you start pro-monument or against monument? Now, have you been convinced to switch sides? I mean, that's not how this works. Um, it, it'll take a lot more discussion and, and a lot more time than we have today to is come back. Is this to just a conversation? This is just a conversation, and I think that conversation does bubble up more frequently in places where you have more diversity because, for example, um, you know, where you have a larger African American population, which, let's, you know, we're all big boys and big girls in this room. Yeah, the African American population in this country that's not recent immigrants to this country from Africa are a product of the African slave trade. We, we got here by being sold into slavery and brought here as slaves. So our ancestry is our forebears were enslaved. So when you have an African American population in a diverse city that has to go play in a park named after the general who led the army who was fighting to preserve that institution, Every now and then, that bubbles up into a conversation about why is this park named after this guy again? Like, what are, you know, why are we doing this? So that, that's why you have the conversation more frequently in Dallas than you probably have it in Lubbock. But the point I wanted to put out there today that I think is um, an interesting one to think about, just for all of us to think about, is what is? I think we have to separate the concept of history from the concept of a memorial, because history is just what it is. History is something that we study. It's facts, it's about what occurred. And it's also the same term history is used to describe the, the act of trying to reduce that to writing to describe it to others for posterity to understand what happened. That's kind of what history is in a nutshell. But a memorial is a little different. It touches on history, there's a historical aspect to it, but that's not really the point. A memorial is to honor, that's the point. I don't think anyone would say, I'll give you a, a, a pretty extreme example, but I don't think anyone would say, we should put a statue of O.J. Simpson in front of every courtroom in the United States because it would be some sort of you know, statement of how the legal system can go wrong in this country. We want to learn from our mistakes and it's an educational thing. No, people would say, why are you honoring him? A statue would be in honor of him. We don't want to build a, use public funds to honor someone who's behavior we, we have judged to be not good, right? So that's sort of what I think people who support removal feel. They feel like, well, if these things occurred and we can judge these actions in retrospect as being not positive, it's not the historical aspect of it that people have a problem with because, again, you can't change what happened. So when people say people who want to remove a monument want to erase history, well, that's not true. What they want to do, I think, and I'm speaking for myself and for others who feel this way, I think they're saying, we don't need monuments of Hitler to remind us that the Holocaust happened. We don't need statues of O.J. Simpson to remind us that justice can be miscarried. So if you believe, and this is, where, this is a whole other debate, if you believe that the Confederacy represented a rebellion against a sovereign nation in an effort to preserve an odious institution and that that is not something that should be celebrated, it should be acknowledged as having happened but not celebrated, then you will have a problem with monuments to the folks who supported that cause. And that's really the distinction, I think, that the, all the debate's gonna have to occur in. What do we do about the history? Do we agree on what happened? Do we agree on the, 
Do we agree even that the institution of slavery is on par with the Holocaust and with apartheid and other things or not? That's a debate. But then the other debate is, do you need to erect statues in the public space of people that you don't share the values with to sort of how, in some ironic way, to show how things can go awry? So that's really how I think a lot of people view, um, including myself, I will say I'm in this camp. I don't need to see a statue of Robert E. Lee, for example, in Dallas to remind me there was a civil war and that, in my opinion, the Confederacy was on the wrong side of that issue. I'm pretty able to, to remember that all on my own, and I have painful re reminders all the time. But of, if you like, saw the statue what? of Robert E. Lee in Virginia? In Virginia? Now we're talking. Well, no, no, let me make this one. This, okay. I just want to, I just want to conclude this point. One, I want more. To, one, 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 one more point of conclusion. This is something that I've had to explain to people because I think people who support taking the monuments down get caught up on this issue. They get confused, I think, on this issue. Robert E. Lee is a figure of historical significance for sure where he made his contribution as a soldier, as a statesman, as a university president, whatever he did in Virginia, his, his birthplace, where his battles took place, where he died, those are places of historical significance. And they have to be acknowledged, in my opinion. You, it, it, it would be insane not to. But he had zero connection whatsoever to Dallas, Texas. None. Never stepped foot in Dallas, Texas. Never a war waged in Dallas, Texas. No educational connection, no political connection. That, that monument in Dallas would simply be to acknowledge his contributions to the Confederacy. And that's where I think there's a distinction. I wouldn't take anything down honoring Robert E. Lee in his hometown, where he lived, where he died, where he was president of the university, where he led a battle. Because that's, that truly is a little bit of kind of trying to erase his contribution, where he actually had a contribution, but he didn't have a contribution in that. Representative Clark. Well, and I would, uh, I would actually disagree with that, that point, Eric, because I think there is a connection that Robert E. Lee does have to Texas. Texas was one of the seceding countries mm -hmm. uh, of the United States, and, it, and he did, in fact, serve in Texas uh, in the Union Army before the Civil War. So there is a, a tie to him uh, with Texas, but more importantly, he represents, as the military leader of the Confederacy, uh, that person really, in many ways, symbolized the, the South. Uh, and after Reconstruction, it's important, I think, in our history to remember, Texas suffered under military occupation for over 11 years during Reconstruction. Uh, there was a federal occupation of the state, the last state to come out of, out of uh, Reconstruction. And so that left a certain memory, and I think it, it punched us a little while ago, there's certain things that's in our fibers that we, we've, it, it's been built into us as part of our history. Um, I think part of how, what Texas is today was formed by the experience of, and one of the lessons I think is important to, to know as a, as a southerner or a southern state, is we can actually lose a war in the South. We've lost a war. And that, we, we won. Well, okay. okay. <laughs> but, but the, that goes back to my point. Yeah. <laughs> but the, 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 the Southerners that came back and came Promote the win. and the, the loss of life, et cetera, left a real mark on the, on the, 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 the southern states. And there are lessons to be learned from that. Uh, but the, the, the symbolism of Robert E. Lee as the leader of the Confederacy of, of the Armed Forces uh, was, in many times, was reckoned. I think what, what you had said, um, you, you made a distinction between a, a, uh, a monument and a memorial. Actually, it's a distinction between history and a, and a, history and a, and a monument, monument but, or a memorial. But, but I will Sorry. say, and I think this is important for us too, okay. what, what was the context in which these monuments were erected? When were they erected and by, by whom? So uh, you look at the uh, war memorial on the, the south wall of the Capitol, uh, it was put there by surviving members who had come back from the South. It was paid for by them in honor of their fallen comrades, their, their comrades. And Do you remember when? That's, it, no. was, it was the late 1890s that that okay. went up, because the Capitol was built in 1886, is that right? 86. 86, and so it was about a decade left. So these were surviving members who would have been 20, 25 and during the war, and were now 60, 65, 70. And so that time, that 
history was preserved for them, and that was a historical act by members who, again, were, were doing this as a memorial. How do you feel about I, one that was put up maybe well, in like 1959 that, inside that's, my that's, office? That's exactly yeah. my point. That's exactly my point. I, there was another era where some things were erected, and it was not done by the survivors of that war who went through Reconstruction, who went through these different trying times but others who were trying to, in some respects, change that actual history. Exactly. And so, uh, you know, I, I think I, smart I, do, I do respect people's diversity of opinion and thoughts of what is or is not appropriate. I will tell you, I don't have much respect at all to someone who commits acts of vandalism mm -hmm. and pulls down a monument. I didn't, I, really do I, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Really, <laughs> but I really can't, I really can't respect anybody. That wasn't me. Did that happen? I really can't respect In Charlottesville, they're watching the video, and I'm going, these people are idiots. They have, one, they don't know their history, but two, do you think uh, Jefferson Davis really cared that some guy's kicking a bronze statue in his bare feet? I mean, that, that's not an act of uh, brilliance I think, there. I think the toes cared a lot more. Yeah, I think the toes cared more. Only well, keep in mind that Robert E. Lee said he did not want not any right. monument memorial. You know, I think we're drawing to a point which I think is really good in the discussion about the, the, where you can really parse these things out, you know, and, and you made that comment about the age of something and what it's, what the purpose is, is I'm not a fan of wholesale knocking down things that have been built because I'm an admirer of just the fact that they were built. You know, what they're built for and why, well, you can figure it out as you, as you go along and I, I can't see the rationale and going, you know, town to town, county to county, you know, uh, Eric made the point about, well, you should commemorate some of these things in a place like Virginia because the man was from Virginia. Well, the same logic applies when we talk about somebody like, you know, John Reagan or some of these people that uh, they've named counties after or buildings here in, uh, in Austin. But I think we need to be real careful about what the what the goal is, and if the goal is to make sure that we understand, you know, where our lives have intersected along this historical arc, then, yeah, some things need to be preserved just for the sake of preserving them, because we need to know that. And then others, like, you know, you made that point, I think there's one plaque in the Capitol, if you read it, and it's, you know, I think it's late 1950s, right? 1959. And I mean, you look at it, and in the context of this conversation, in the context of who we are and what we are, one is it's a complete fabrication. It doesn't really have any business being there because it's not teaching us anything other than we were pretty good at lying to ourselves in 1959 or whatever it was. And you look at that and say, well, what's the harm of prying something off this, something like this off the wall? I didn't do it. And yeah, and the, okay. <laughs> and, and, and the and I know he didn't do it, but I mean I say figuratively because I told him I'd actually help him do it. So, uh, but I mean you you look at you look at it that you look at that, and the truth is that's something that actually should be gone because it serves no purpose other than to remind us that we were good at lying to ourselves in 1959. It doesn't, you know, Travis's point to when that memorial was built at the Capitol. It does intersect with something that's very real and personal to the people that built it, meaning their loved ones, their brothers, their friends that they left on battlefields from, you know, from, uh, you know, the valley of Texas all the way to Virginia. That means something. But, but let me make a point on that. I think the plaque we're talking about is the, uh, the, the Confederacy, the, the, the children of the Confederacy creed. Confederacy creed. creed. Yes. If and you haven't seen it in the Capitol, you really ought to go read it. And I would say it does not need to be taken down or, or destroyed. Uh, I think it, it is a, a complete mischaracterization of the facts, is it? as I know them historically. But it needs uh -oh. to be preserved. It needs to be preserved for the purpose and the reason it went up there was during while we were going through the civil rights movement in the United States, and it was it was a it was a, a attempt to defend the Jim Crow laws, to defend uh, the, the segregation in the South, and defend these actions. It was not about. It was not about the, the, the war between states. It was about that so you, time. So I think it's important to preserve it because, okay. and one of the most important things of history is we need to probably learn from our mistakes more than we've learned. This from is our the O.J. Simpson argument of why so, we should no, no, put him no, in front no, of every again, courthouse. Now, but does it belong where it is? You know, that that's going to be a, a, a well, sure conversation. But it needs important. to be kept somewhere because it reflects accurately a movement, a group of people, what they believed and felt. Felt enough to put it on a flag. A civil rights a museum wall. would be perfect, and, and that, or a civil war it, museum. But this is where some people's heads were at at this particular moment of time. That is history, too. Senator Creighton. So the problem with the museum effort is just, as I stated before, there there are just many families that don't live near museums. You know, there are there are many 
families, kids and grandkids and the experiences they they share that they are just not in downtown Houston or downtown Dallas uh, to be able to go into real expensive museum. And then if they're moved to museums, is it really uh, an accurate um, portrayal of history when that takes place? So we, we fault those in the past that misdirect or misguide us on the depictions that, it, that sort of portray exactly how history uh, laid out. But then the University of Texas m removes Jefferson Davis's statue and the monument that was there on campus with the promise that it would move it to a museum in a prominent location on campus <laughs> and depict the accurate history involved with the man. If you go to see that uh, monument now, it's in a dark, obscure corner, uh, poorly lit, not a museum, of a building on campus, and there is an accurate depiction of the history of the creation of the monument. Which is very, very different than depicting history, right? I'd rather the bad news about that man be laid out all day long, as much as you, wall space as you have, to be able to read and teach from that where we are today compared to then. But even the University of Texas, and I'm an alum, could not get it right. They absolutely failed everyone in Texas on that move. You know, on, on another so, note. Let me, and let, me, let me just finish with this real quick. And I know, I know uh, there's many points that have been made. But Robert E. Lee has a deep, deep connection to the city of Dallas and, 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 and to the state of Texas. A second lieutenant in Terry's Texas Rangers that fought for the Confederacy is never going to be mentioned. He just died on the field. And what did he die for? You know, but Robert E. Lee is the face of... Of, of, of what happened at that time, who Lincoln had great respect for. And you know, you and I aren't as smart as Lincoln, right? We're in a revolving door as politicians, and we'll be gone, and we'll never be remembered for anything we did. Whoa, whoa. But. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I like where this is going at all. <laughs> but, but Abraham Lincoln, who I hold the utmost, just the greatest respect for, he had incredible respect for Robert E. Lee. Okay. So again, I would just say, don't melt, bury, and hide, and, and rid ourselves of history, good or bad. Depict the history accurately. If it says the man and the date of which he was born and died, and that's not enough for you, and it's offensive without accurately portraying what they stood for, portray it. You know, Brandon, I, I was going to tell you that I, I was a little sad when they moved the statue because during my time on the 40 acres, I used to find a good spot there in the shade to take a nap. It sounds like, wow. <laughs> I'm, that was uh, during your 8 o'clock class, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, because uh, you got to find them when the sun's hitting at the right spot. So yeah. you get in the right spot, you get a little shade. And so when they told me, that, uh, I, I didn't remember that, that that was a statue. And I said, wait a minute, they're going to move that statue? Come on. <laughs> and, <I don't, laughs> and, and to the audience, I don't think we're all that far apart. I, I think that, that much of the opinion is we need to portray history accurately and do everything we can not to offend others that feel disenfranchised from memorials long ago. But if we balance those, as Gettysburg did with, this is just an example, with Lee and Grant, and then we also depict history accurately for what they stood for, well then we're teaching our kids and future generations from that. We're not hiding from it. Because Texans don't hide. That's embarrassing, that's unintelligent, and that's not the way, that, that's not what we stand for. So I, I would just put a different perspective on that, that we can win on this negotiation and compromise together, but removing these um, examples of history instead of teaching from them is the wrong way to go, and it's un-Texan. Thank you. I, yeah, I would just mention, very much agree with what the Senator said, but you know, we spend a lot of time in Texas, and we think of ourselves as different than the East Coast and California. And this is kind of part of a bigger thing that culturally we like to be different than what we see going on there. And we see a movement of political correctness sometimes going on the East Coast and the Left Coast. And it's concerning and we worry, I think, as a state that we're not going to let some of the issues that happen there come and define us to make us just like the rest of the state. And regardless of being a Confederate issue or a monument issue or anything else, sometimes that's just the knee-jerk reaction of Texans. We see things happening in Hollywood. We see things happening in a thought in the East Coast. And we say, we don't want to be like them. We are Texans. We're not going to do that. And I think part of what we're 
questioning is, you know, how sincere are some of the things that we have seen? You know, is it a wedge movement? Is it something that's being brought in? Or, you know, what are we doing to make sure that we maintain a difference culturally than perhaps some of the rest of the United States that we don't agree with where they're heading? Do we have the ability to take questions? Does anyone? I don't know if we do or not. Yes, please. Well, I think we want to do that. I have a question having to do with, with plaques, placing plaques uh, around a monument to interpret the monument. So, say it again. Placing plaques at the base of a monument, mm -hmm. providing the interpretation of, let's use Jefferson Davis, a good example. I, I, yeah, I want to speak to that in the context of saying something and somewhat in response to what Senator Creighton brought up. Because, you know, I have a lot of respect for Senator Creighton, one of my, actually one of my favorite legislators. I get along with him very well. He's got a great staff. He's a great guy. Um, I, I, I don't quite understand the, the rationale behind the argument of, you know, I mean, everyone doesn't have access to a museum. Well, not everybody has access to the Capitol either. I mean, like, every, wherever you put something, it's where it is. Um, it can't be all places at all times. And wherever you put it, it's not going to be close to somebody. So if you put the thing in the capital, it's not close to people in the Valley or Dallas. So you, you got to be in Austin for it to be close. Otherwise, you got to take a trip the same way you would if the thing was in a museum like the Texas Civil War Museum that we do have in White Settlement, Texas. You put it there, you got to drive to White Settlement if you want to see it. So anywhere you put it, someone is not going to be next door to it. Someone's going to have to go some ways to it. So I'm not sure how compelling I, that argument is to me at least, but um, but respect to the the issue of you know plaques, explanatory plaques and things like that to plaques. To me, this issue is not really about, you know, we talk all the time about being fair and balanced, as though, you know, just everything's just gotta be equal to be, you know, good. It means it's fair. If, if it's equal on both sides, it, by definition, it's fair. I don't think this is really a fairness thing, it's, a, it's, an, it's about appropriateness. And I think the question that some of us have, and I know I have it, is do we need to, in order to acknowledge the occurrence of an event, if that event, if we agree, and we, I don't know that we agree, Brandon, but if we, if we agree that an event in the past was not good, do we need to put something in the public space that appears to honor the event as opposed to having that stuff in a museum to learn from. In other words, I'll give you another example. So, you know, a, a pair of slave shackles or something like that. That's an item for a museum. It's, you can't deny that that was used in the, in, the, in the context of slavery. It's something for people to learn from. You find a pair of old slave shackles, it's a historical artifact. You put it in a museum, you, you use it to teach. I don't think we should put it up in a statue of some shackles on the Capitol grounds, to, again, like the O.J. Simpson example, to be ironic and show how badly things can, can go. The best example I can think of where this issue has been dealt with in the right way, in my opinion, is in Germany with respect to the Holocaust. They absolutely do not allow public displays of anything that is an homage to Hitler or that war and what they did because they have collectively decided that they made a mistake, that they were wrong. And you can learn about it all day long in a museum, but at the Bundestag in Germany, where you know, their, their Congress, there are no sta Hitler statues out front. As important as he was to their nation, as many people who got caught up in fighting in that war, who were frankly just fighting because they were Germans and they were told to go fight, not because they they may it personally even had embraced some anti-Semitic doctrine. They were fighting because they were told to. It still, it still doesn't, it still doesn't in the German consciousness, it still doesn't warrant honoring the leader of the movement in a statue I, I, on the Capitol sorry, grounds. I don't think it's really a fair comparison to why? compare Robert this e. Lee. This is a good debate. Why? To, to Adolf Hitler. And, and this is why, because in Germany there are, everywhere all of Germany, war memorials where they not not honoring Hitler. Honoring right. the servicemen who fought for their country by and put there by their their survivors and by their families, uh, but why but the not, to, but not to honor Adolf Hitler? Now convert. So why not? Why don't they have that? But my, my point is, I don't think that we have those sorts of uh, offensive when you recognize historical figures. We're here in Nacogdoches, the oldest town in Texas, uh, just down the road. We'll have, there's a statue of Thomas Jefferson Rusk. 
there were certainly things in his past that somebody will find it offensive. So do we need to pull up the Thomas Jefferson Rusk monuments? Do we need to go back and there may have been. But what about the, the leader of the Confederacy? I, 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 I want to comment on the, on the Hitler comparison, too. I, I just think it's easily distinguishable. Why? I, 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 I think that a, that a lot of the very, very liberal left and the lost media, they talk about Hitler in comparison to some of these activity, the, 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 these monuments and, and, uh, and members of the Confederacy, Robert E. Lee and others, Albert Sidney Johnson, that, as the same. But uh, Ger German leader successors had no respect whatsoever for Hitler. I mean, it was, it was pretty much universal to remove uh, he, you know his his name and his reference from from the, uh, the, the, the you know the, the political landscape and, and the history books the any way they possibly could. But yet, as I mentioned before, the man we both have great respect for, Abraham Lincoln, had incredible respect for Robert E. Lee. And so, nationally, as families that might have four sons in that household and two fought for the Confederacy and two fought for the Union. And so many of their cousins were split and on and on. And they had great respect for Grant and great respect for Lee. And that has nothing in the world to do with Adolf Hitler. So as we depict history, we can't get lost in, in those type of emotional arguments That's because emotional they are, argument. they're very distinguishable. And they the, are not. The fact that we depict uh, Robert E. Lee and, or we, we have monuments that show Robert E. Lee's presence and the history behind uh, what, how he served in, the, in this country and in the military, I think is a direct result of Lincoln's appreciation and respect no. for him because 10 years later, 30 years later, 80 years later, 120 years later, generation after generation, they felt that same respect and then they erected monuments at the times that they did and we mentioned plaques from 1959 in the Texas Capitol when Democrats agreed that that should be placed on the wall. We, we, we have references to that, but in, in 1958, the year right before that, the United States Congress recognized Confederate soldiers as veterans. So it's not like it was a, a mean-spirited Texas um, sort of response to we're not letting go. Nationally, these things were happening at the very same time, and there was an evolving um, you know, continuum that continued to happen as the dialogue kept going. But again, we're not going to be in office very long in the eternity oh. second that we're here. That and, we, for, and for us to, to pander to constituencies, to remove parts of history so that we can be popular now, to question the great men and women in the past that thought it was important to have those monuments then is egregious. And let me, I, I let think me we should stay away from it. Get two <laughs> questions lined up, if I may. First question has to do with Statutory Hall in, in D.C. Uh, I guess most of you have seen that on your tour at the Capitol. Do you believe that uh, that kind of presentation itself of the great leaders? We actually have something similar, you could say, in the Capitol. We have photographs, our paintings of, of our governors. Uh, is is are you all troubled by that at all? Anyone troubled by that? Yes. We don't have any bias or prejudice. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> but if you saw five statues next to each other, Lincoln, Grant, Lee, King, and Chavez, did you say, I admire the all five of them? No. Lee, give us that number again. Who was it? <laughs> <laughs> Lee, Grant, Lee, King, and Chavez. Yeah. Maybe you don't agree with them, but they stood for something. You know, I, I, uh, I think the point is that we would all find issue with someone there, as most would, but the removal of those monuments just because, as walking by, uh, many of us might find issue with one of them is, is not the right 
mindset, but more to teach from uh, that monument hall and what each of them stood for. And, and we, we allow our kids and our families to draw from that in the ways as parents and grandparents we choose to teach. And that is the liberty and freedom that's involved with, with uh, the sentiment behind uh, a learning environment in every respect. Because classrooms and museums, I just, I, I hate to break it to everybody, but that's just not the end of the road for teaching our youth and our next generations. That, that's not, it starts at home. And I, again, I know Dallas is famous for supporting billion dollar stadiums and maybe those are next door, museums are wonderful, but in small town Texas, uh, it's easier for a little tiny city to bank a monument or a plaque in a park than it is to build a museum to put that thing there. And so it happens, and, and that, that one, experience one is just part of it. One last question, if I may. Oh, did you? Have no, that was my answer. Well, you know, uh, you know, you ticked off the list. I can tell you that of each of those five uh, people, there's things that I admire and actually dislike about all of them. I mean, there's, there's points. And, you know, Brandon made the, the comment that he had named his uh, uh, child Barrett. You know, my son, his middle name is Hernan, and where I'm from, you know, and I named him after Hernan Cortes, who was a conqueror of Mexico, and he's a very controversial figure. But the reason I, I named him after Hernan is because the guy burned the boats. You all know what that means? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and to me, that's a big deal. You know, I, I tell my kids that all the time is when you do stuff, you got to burn the boats. You can't find a way back. If you want to get finished and get things done, you can't look back and you can't have a way to go back, and that's a way to get it done. And that's something that I admire about the guy, and that's why I named my child that. But I don't, like, each one of those names on that list, there's something vile about each one of them, and there's something really nice about and them, isn't too. And isn't that true for every historical figure? No. There's, no. A, there's probably a every couple that are not. Figure, no, there's not going to be figures that there will be things in their life, their background, their whatever, a belief system they had. The thing that on par with about slavery? The, well, this isn't about slavery. It's about those five That's individuals. That's about Robert E. Lee. About, and Robert E. Lee is not about slavery. Well, there is our debate. Okay. Okay, There's so the that's debate. So, but there are things about his life that were entirely admirable. He was one of the chief proponents and really that allowed the healing after the Civil War was because of Robert E. Lee's leadership um, and, there, and, and so some of his writings, the things he did to let the war end. He said, we will stack arms. We will not continue the war. We will not continue the guerrilla war. We need to bring the nation together. But so, he led an army that purpose he, he and led, goal was to army, continue he, slavery. He defended his native Virginia. Uh, he was a principal man. In fact, he was some great things. One of the great author, great writer, so an interesting person. And a guy and who there, fought there, to preserve slavery. Are there things that you don't like about him? I can understand that. It's a pretty big but, one, but, though, but again, Travis. But again, but again, okay, no, let's go to in a, in a country that was founded by men that, that everyone across the pond called traitors. Yeah, and, and let's, 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 let's take George Washington. Let's they don't go have back. a whole lot of statues to let's our go, guys in Great Britain for that very reason. Let's go back to the first, the the first revolution with George Washington. Do we, do we look forward to a day in 50 years that we've got to take down the Washington Monument, we, we've got to rename the Capitol because he was a slave owner in Virginia? Is, is that, is, where, where does this end? And what I'm worried about really is the, the historical context. What gives us the right in this moment in time to change what somebody else did 50, 100, 150, 200 years ago? Because there's a news flash. There's going to be people looking back at us in 100 years and saying, I can't believe they did these things. We need to purge them from history. And I'm reminded of the, the George Orwell You're novel. Back. That's a trope. That's not true. No one's proposing no, that. No, nobody's proposing that because we don't know what they'll do in 100 years, Eric. No, We're not there yet. I'm saying no one's proposing but, erasing but, but, or well, destroying history. Respects, it is. It, where Gentlemen, we've run There's over by five minutes. Today. We could go on another hour. Or but, Again, this what is a good I time like for me to is, boogie back home, by the way. <laughs> what I like is the conversation. I think it's very clear we have some very bright, intelligent lawmakers here who are interested in trying to work together to resolve issues. In this case, we're talking history. Most of the time, you're not. Uh, being with the Texas Historical Commission, believe me, we'd love to see you talk about history a lot more. But these are issues that uh, need to be talked about. We had a county judge in northeast Texas who called THC to say that his life had been threatened, kids had been threatened because of the Confederate monument that stood on the courthouse grounds. Uh, 
Fortunately, this was investigated, turned out to be one individual who made a threat, and, and it was not a, a broad community matter, but it was one individual made a threat on the county judge. Turns out the state archeological landmark designation, SAL, applies to these courthouse properties. And so it's, it's not something where the county comes in and just knocks something down. It had, they have to go through procedure. But again, these things are happening in the real world. That's why we had this discussion. You'll probably be hearing more about it. it it's just real world stuff. And thank you, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Well, folks, this is the moment we have been waiting for. Uh, again, I want to thank our colleagues, and I hope what you saw is what I felt up here, and that's people that are able to discuss things, uh, and hopefully intelligently, but peacefully and spiritedly. It was, a, it was a great exchange. I was glad to be part of it. Let's wrap up. This was our final event for the Lone Star Legislative Summit. Uh, again, I want to, uh, Donna Finley, where are you, Donna? We want to thank you for the job and lining this up, all the staff of the Natchez County Chamber of Commerce. We want to thank our sponsors again for the, the donations and contributions to make this possible. Thanks again to all of our speakers, committee, and staff that did this. And most of all, thank you in the audience for taking the time to be part of this. We look forward to seeing you again in two years back in Nacogdoches. But next up, Austin, February 2019. These guys will be joining us again for Nacogdoches SFA Days in the campus. Come see us in Austin. God bless. Great seeing you. It's been a wonderful time. Paul, last thing, last thing. If you're in the parking garage where you signed in, there's a, they can give you a card. It looks like this, a little plastic card, or a parking pass. If you need a parking pass, grab it so you don't have to pay. But, again, thank you all for coming. Good night.